Welcome to the Japanese Circulation Society Guideline Webinar Series. My name is Hiroyuki Tsutui, Kyushu University of Fukuoka, Japan. Japanese Circulation Society JC has started Guideline Webinar Series to present the latest topics from Japan and share them with physicians and healthcare professionals worldwide. We hope this webinar will enhance the partnership and the friendship between Japanese Circulation Society and Cardiovascular Societies in the world, especially in Asia. Let me share my slides. Hey, today's topic is the diagnosis and treatment of acute and chronic heart failure. This is my disclosure. Heart failure guideline by Japanese Circulation Society and Japanese Heart Failure Society was published in Circulation Journal in 2018. After the publication of this guideline, novel pharmacological and non-pharmacological therapy have been reported. Therefore, guideline focused update was published in September last year. This has been published in both Circulation Journal and Journal of Cardiac Failure simultaneously. Uh, one of the major revisions in the focus update is heart failure treatment algorithm as shown in this slide. Stage C treatment is selected uh, according to left ventricular ejection fraction. Uh, this, the basic treatment for HEF-REF is a triple therapy with ACE inhibitor or R, beta blocker, and MRA. In patients with symptomatic HEF-REF despite optimal medical treatment, replacement from ACE inhibitor or ARB to ARNI is recommended. SGLT2 inhibitors are also recommended regardless of the presence or absence of diabetes. In symptomatic HEF-REF patients and severe functional mitral regurgitation, percutaneous uh, mitral valve repair should be considered. In patients with severe symptoms, even at rest and with repeated hospitalization for worsening heart failure, despite optimal treatment for stage C, treatment for stage D needs to be considered. Uh, pharmacological therapy is the cornerstone of heart failure treatment. An important point is to implement optimal pharmacological therapy before performing non-pharmacological therapy. Another important point of this uh, algorithm is to use the maximally tolerated doses of these drugs, which have been shown to improve the clinical outcomes. Uh, the treatment algorithm of heart failure in Japanese guideline is similar to that shown in ESC heart failure guideline published last year. Our uh, JCS guideline will provide useful information regarding the management of patients with heart failure worldwide. So, Dr. Kusunose, please start today's webinar. Thank you, Professor Tsutsumi, for the opening introduction and brief summary. Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking time to join the webinar. I'm Ken Yakusunose from Tokushima University and today's facilitator. This webinar is based on two cases and two lectures. Sharing today's session, we have two presenters and two commentators. I introduce four doctors. Associate Professor Tomomi Ide from QC University, a strong ex ex uh, expertise and active research in the cardiovascular disease, including past physiology of heart failure and failing myocardium. Next is Dr. Fujino Takeo from QC University. He has many clinical experiences and is working for research with Dr. Ide. Professor Yasui Sakata, Yasui Sakata from Osaka University. His strong expertise and active research in cardiovascular disease, including viral heart disease and advanced heart failure. Last, Dr. Daisuke Nakamura from Osaka University. He has a lot of clinical experience to focus on cardiovascular diseases with Dr. Sakata. I will explain how to ask questions. When you have any questions, please try your questions in the comment box in English or Japanese. Please feel free to type the questions to make it more exciting. Now, let's start this webinar. 
Dr. Fujino will start his presentation for first case. Dr. Fujino, please. Uh, thank you very much for uh, introducing me, Dr. Kusunose. Uh, I will share my slide. Okay, uh, my name is Takeo Fujino. Uh, I'm a heart failure cardiologist at, from uh, Kyushu University. So today uh, I, was, uh, I would like to start my presentation about the optimization of heart failure medical therapy. I have no COI to disclose. So the patient is a 40 years old male. The diagnosis is uh, number one, the chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, New York heart association functional plus two. Number two, a known ischemic cardiomyopathy, cardiomyopathy after aortic valve uh, replacement for severe aortic regurgitation. And number three, a non-sustained uh, ventricular tachycardia. 10 years before the admission, he underwent aortic valve replacement in another hospital for severe aortic regurgitation with low ejection fraction. After the surgery, LV diastolic diameter was 59 millimeter and the LVEF was 34%. Carbeterol 10 milligram and spironolactone 25 milligram were initiated. An ACE inhibitor was not started due to his hypertension. Three months before the admission, he hospitalized for uh, acute decompensated heart failure triggered by physical stress, such as overwork, in another hospital. Non-sustained ventricular tachycardia was also observed. After treatment with inotropes and diuretics, he discharged home. However, his heart failure soon worsened without any causes, and he was treated for ADHF again. After discharge, he was referred to our hospital for the optimization of heart failure therapy. On admission, his blood pressure was 98 over 62 millimeter mercury and heart rate was 75 beats per minute. Physical examination showed he did not have any clinical findings of congestion and low cardiac output. He was taking frosamide 20 milligram, carbidrol 10 milligram, epirenone 50 milligram, amiodarone 200 milligram, and warfarin 2 milligram daily. He was not taking ACE inhibitors or ARBs. In laboratory data, white blood cell count, hemoglobin level, and platelet were in normal range. Serum creatinine was slightly increased. His liver function and elk rights were preserved. His BNP level was markedly increased to over 800. His chest x-rays showed cardiomegaly and slight pulmonary congestion. Electrocardiography showed normal sinus rhythm, left axis deviation, and complete right bundle branch block. His echocardiography showed LV diastolic diameter of 76 millimeter and systolic diameter of 70 millimeter with ejection fraction of 28%. There was no evidence for mechanical aortic valve failure with mild valvular uh, regurgitation and also mild mitral regurgitation. Coronary angiography showed there's no significant stenosis in left and right coronary arteries. Right heart catheterization showed that a right artery pressure was normal, but mean arctic, um, sorry, mean pulmonary artery pressure was increased to 28 millimeter mercury, and pulmonary artery wedge pressure was also increased to 24 millimeter mercury. Cardiac output cardiac index and mixed venous oxygen saturation were decreased. Cystic vascular resistance was increased up to over uh, 1,800. So uh, he is a patient with stage C, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, 
NYHA2, and recent heart failure hospitalization twice. He, on admission, he was taking beta blocker, mineral cortical receptor antagonist, and diuretics for congestion. So in this case, based on this algorithm in our guideline, we started Barsaltan 40 milligram, and then initiated dapagliflozin 10 milligram. After this discharge, we switched Barsaltan 40 milligram to sacubitary Barsaltan 100 milligram daily. So this slide shows this patient's clinical cause because he was hypotensive at the time of admission. We sequentially and carefully adjusted heart failure medical therapy according to the guideline. After the initiation of Barsaltan, his blood pressure slightly decreased, but he was asymptomatic. We then started dapagliflozin and switched Barsaltan to sacubitary Barsaltan. We did not see further depression of his blood pressure. His potassium level was stable. And six months later, his heart failure symptom got better and BNP level markedly decreased. His renal function also slightly improved. So chest X-ray showed improved cardiomegaly and from a pulmonary congestion during this uh, the course. And echocardiography showed decreased LV diastolic volume, LV end systolic volume, and increased ejection fraction, suggesting left ventricular reverse remodeling with optimal medical therapy. So uh, I'd like to start the discussion. Uh, in this case, we experienced LV reverse remodeling with optimal medical therapy. Recently, uh, this is a single arm a prospective multi center study. The proof HF study showed that successful reverse remodeling with sacubitary balsartan. So, this uh, clinical course of this case is consistent with the result of this proof HF study. And in this case, the patient was hypotensive but asymptomatic, so we successfully initiated sacubitary balsartan. In this sub-analysis of Paradigm HF trial, the subgroup of patients with systolic blood pressure less than 110 showed increased blood pressure after initiating enalapril or sacubitary balsartan. And these are Kaplan-Meier curves for primary endpoint in this trial. The subgroup of patients with lower blood pressure showed the same relative benefit of sacubitary balfazdan over enalapril. However, uh, we should be careful because in this trial, a cystic blood pressure of less than 100 at screening were excluded, but the incident of hypertensive related adverse event was significantly higher in the sacubitary balsartan group. In our case, uh, we carefully initiated sacubitary balsartan and he was well tolerated. So uh, this is the summary of this case. According to our guideline, we initiated Barsartan and Dapagliflozin, and then switched from Barsartan to Sacubitary Barsartan. His hypotension was asymptomatic and did not worsen during the course. The echocardiography showed left ventricular reverse remodeling with the optimization of medical therapy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Fujino. So, Dr. Fujino showed the case in FREF. The cardiac output is significantly reduced with high wage pressure and systemic vascular resistance is elevated. So, after the medication, so LV reverse remodeling occurred during follow up. So, the case is very informative in thinking about the treatment of heart failure using medications. So, next. So, Dr. Ide will start her presentation for keynote lectures. Yes, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Kusunose. Let me start my slide. Okay. 
Heart failure is a major health problem in most of the countries. The clinical course of heart failure is shown here, as well as everyone knows. There are four stages of heart failure from stage A to stage D. The patients with established heart failure often have repeated episode of acute exacerbation of heart failure. The repeated heart failure episode gradually leads to more severe stage to, uh, from stage C to stage D. And uh, the patients cannot go backward through the stages. Our goal of the treatment of the patients is to keep the patients from progressing through the stages or to slow down the progression. In order to describe the real world of heart failure in Japan, we collected data of acute decomposited heart failure from randomly selected 128 hospitals all over Japan. We analyzed totally over 14,000 in 2013 as JROHF registry. We found there are 7.7% of in-hospital death and among the rest of 11, 11,120 patients, we found 60.4% of all close death in one year, and almost one third of the patients were rehospitalized after discharge. The overall prognosis of heart failure is still very uh, poor. So we know now no need to strengthen pharmacological treatment of heart failure. Let me quickly overview the part of standard pharmacological therapy for heart failure according to the guideline focused update and uh, some of the clinical data. Um, this is a treatment algorithm of heart failure that uh, Dr. Tsui shows already. A multidisciplinary, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is an algorithm data. A multidisciplinary disease management and uh, exercise therapy are very important in both stages. Palliative care is introduced early in stage C, aiming at improvement of quality of life or of overall patients. Management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, HEFREF, is well established for very long as uh, established guideline directed medical therapy for chronic HEFREF consisting of beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and MRAs. In patients with the systemic HEFREF, despite optimal basic treatment, replacement of ACE inhibitor or ILB by an ANI is recommended to further reduce morbidity and mortality. Um, initial introduction of RNA should be also considered in this guideline. Furthermore, SGL2 inhibitors are also recommended regardless of the presence or absence of diabetes. I'll show some clinical trial data underlying of this algorithm from here. Sacubitril valsartan is a compound containing, of, uh, uh, containing an ARB and valsartan. And uh, ARB at Balsotan and a pro, uh, prodrug of nephrilysin inhibitor sacubitril bounded at one to one per molecule. Sacubitril is converted to the active form of sacubitrilat and inhibiting the degradation of endogenous natriuretic peptide. Nephrilysin inhibitor results in an increase of AT2, which is blocked by Balsotan. So this is uh, the data of a Paradigm HF study, and it clarified that sacrobitary balsartan exhibit a survival improving effect exceeding that of ACE inhibitor enaropril. Based on this evidence, switching from ACE inhibitor ARB to ARNI in patient with a symptomatic HEFREF with a standard treatment with ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, and MRI is recommended as class one. So this graph shows the measurement of BNP and antibro BNP in paradigm HF. Red shows the antibro BNP and blue shows the BNP. Um, BNP increased in after eight to 10 weeks in uh, the sacrovitri barsartan and decreased in, in April. So we have to be careful which uh, biomarker used. Furthermore, in the Pioneer Heart Failure Study, when sacrovitri balsartan was administered to patients with acute decomposite heart failure with HEFREF after stabilization of hemodynamic before discharge, antibro BNP significantly decreased eight weeks after discharge compared with anapril alone, and significant improvement was also noted in heart failure rehospitalization of or cardiovascular event. Sacvitrio balsartan was also tested to see its effectiveness in HEFPEF patients in Paragon HF. 
there was not a significant result in the overall population. The p-value was 0.06, but subgroup analysis shows a significant effect of this drug in LVEF less than 57. So combined the data with the paradigm HF that um, we now see that uh, um, uh, the administration of RNA for HEF may be considered, but on a, uh, the, it, it might be def- effective in heart failure with the mi- mid-range or might reduced heart failure ejection fraction between 40 to 50%. The presented case uh, shows by um, by Dr. Fujino showed obviously reverse remodeling after the treatment. Now, RNA has evidence for reverse remodeling in HEF, HEF ref by proved heart failure. There are negative correlation between changes from baseline in log antibra PNP and from baseline in uh, baseline LVEF. There are increase in ejection fraction with the reduction of both left ventricular and diastolic volume and left ventricular and systolic volume. So um, the next uh, sodium glucose transporters, SGLT2 inhibitors, such as empagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and canagliflozin are recommended in the management of patients with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular diseases. Based on compelling evidence from the EMPAREG, declared t- uh, TIMI 58 and CANVAS trial, after that, there have been several evidence SGLT2 for HEF-REF and HEF-PEF, regardless of the presence or absence of diabetes. In both the DAPA-HF and uh, emperor reduced trial, uh, those clarified that both SGLT2 inhibitors reduced the aggravation of heart failure, hospitalization, and the cardiovascular death events, regardless of the presence of the, or the absence of the complication of type 2 diabetes. There are accumulating evidence for the beneficial effect of kidney of SGLT2 inhibitor dapagrofil. Dapagrofil also reduced the risk of kidney failure and cardiovascular death, heart failure, hospitalization, and prolonged survival in CKD patient with or without type 2 diabetes reported from DAPA CKD. Subgroup analysis of DAPA CKD shows the reduction of the risk kidney fa- ki- risk of kidney failure and uh, cardiovascular disease are prolonged survival in CKD patient with or without type 2 type diabetes independently of history of heart failure. And the, um, at last, uh, I've brought in decrease the heart rate by inhibiting the IF channel uh, with you know, atrial node cells, and it's indicated only for patients with the sinus rhythm. It has no influence on cardiac contractility. The SHIFT study showing here demonstrated that the treatment target of this drug in patients with HEF-REF is solely decreased the heart rate. This double-blind randomized control study, SHIFT study, shows a significant decrease cardiovascular death and admission for heart failure by 18% in comparison with placebo. Since in Japan, um, J-SHIFT trial was designed and performed in the patient with HEF-REF with the heart rate was 75 BPM and over. So our recommendation state that this is class 2A as showing here with the heart rate over 75 BPM with sinus rhythm. So I just need to introduce quickly several uh, clinical trials uh, based on the updated guideline. So understanding of the algorithm may help for your um, clin- daily clinical practice for heart, for heart failure patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the excellent keynote lecture, Dr. Ide. So Dr. Ide summarized the important problem of heart failure management. So the problem is gradually progression of heart failure, even if under the medications. So a more appropriate heart failure treatment would be desired. So the new treatment option, ANI and SGLT2 inhibitors and ibuprofen were summarized uh, from the basic and the clinical standpoints. So yes, let's start to uh, 
let's move to the uh, questions part. So there are already some questions from comment box. So I will take it to one by one. And so yes, so first case, uh, first first question. So yes, I read. Oh, uh, in this case, question one. So in this case. Reverse remodeling by medications was remarkably developed. It seems to be a good response case. In large trials, VNP was increased by effects of neprilysin inhibitions. How was it in this case? Did you assess the case by NT pro VNP? So please answer the Dr. Fujino. Okay, uh, I will answer this question. Uh, actually, we did not check NT pro BNP in this case. Uh, as uh, Dr. Ide mentioned, uh, previous studies have shown that BNP level may increase early after initiation of sacrificial bar certain. But uh, in this case, we did not catch the phase in our this case, and the BNP level was constantly uh, decreased during the course in this case. Thank you. So the next question is, so due to recent advances in cardiovascular medicine, so we can select several new choices of treatment for HEF-REF to improve the prognosis. So when introducing them for the first time, which drug should be started first? So, okay, uh, please answer the Dr. Fujino or Dr. Ide, please. Yes, I would answer. Um, our guidelines st uh, stated that we start uh, ACE inhibitor ARB and beta blocker MRA. If the patients are refractory or symptomatic, we can switch from ACE inhibitor or ARB to sacrobitary valsartan and then add SGLT2 inhibitors. But as ESC guideline update published after our guideline, we can select four uh, from any of the four you know, uh, mm -hmm. so fantastic four yeah. from the beginning and maximize the benefit. So we think we do not have to stick to any one drug and you can combine them according to the patient's status. That's my answer. Thank you so much. So the combination is very important. So, okay. So the last question is, so as you noted, the treatment of HEFREF has been established. How should we consider about the treatment of half pef or half heart failure mid range heart uh, uh, heart failure mid range uh, ef so please dr ide oh yeah um, as i showed sacrificial valsartan can be used as a treatment for heart failure with mid range or might reduced heart failure as for HEFPEF, um, we recently had uh, the positive result of Emperor preserved. So that um, Emperor glyphosin or in the future other SGLT2 inhibitors may be the choice for HEFPEF treatment. Of course, especially characteristic of HEFPEF shows the combina uh, comorbid comorbidities of CKD, uh, chronic kidney disease and anemia for HEFPEF patients both of which are shown to be improved by empagliflozin. So that I think that's kind of a reasonable choice to um, select an uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, but uh, those are not included in our guideline yet. Thank yes. So, okay. So uh, it's a, so a very good uh, question. So the, thank you for the answers to the question. So next, let's start the second case. Uh, Dr. Nakamura will start his presentation. Uh, please, Dr. Nakamura. Thank you, Dr. Kusunose, for introducing me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm really honored to be here and make a presentation today. Let me start my presentation. I have no disclosure concerning the presentation. So GHS guidelines focus update on diagnosis and treatment for heart failure, recommended as class 2A that parkinson's mitral valve repair should be considered in patients with half breath who have symptomatic functional severe mitral irritation. Even under the guideline directly make a treatment and who are determined by a barber team to be anatomically amenable to repair with mitral creep. Although surgical treatment is not feasible. 
I think which means the case selection by the hat team discussion for microclip was really important. Today, I would report a case about a 71-year-old male patient with advanced heart failure due to ischemic cardiomyopathy and severe function of mitral regurgitation. In 23, this patient underwent percutaneous coronary intervention to left anterior descending artery for ST elevation myocardial infarction. For a few decades, his condition had been stable, but from 2021 March, he experienced repeated hospitalization due to heart failure, despite adequate guideline direct medical therapy and percutaneous coronary intervention to the residual stenosis. And also he has severe functional mitral regurgitation. Therefore, this patient was referred to our hospital for further evaluation and treatment of heart failure and severe mitral regurgitation. This patient clinical practice scale has four vulnerable and the state's predicted risk of mortality was 8.605%, which indicates is obviously high operative risk score. Past history includes diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And she had received guideline directed medical therapy, includes bisporo, spironolactone, empagliprogen, and dual antipretal therapy, which was the maximal doses he could tolerate due to dizziness. And the S inhibitor cannot be indicated because of low blood pressure and his low renal function. His blood pressure was 7 to over 56 mm of mercury, and his pulse rate was 72. The sad heart sound was audible with the polycystic murmur at the apex. On admission, serum creatinine was 2.30, plasma B type natural peptidal BNP was 2260. As shown on the left side, X-ray demonstrated the cardiomegaly in which CTR was 57% and primary congestion. On the right side, ECG showed sinus raising and narrow QRS, which indicated that he was not appropriate for CRT treatment. So this is transfer circuit cardiography. It demonstrated the uh, left ventricular and diastolic diameter of 69 millimeter and systolic diameter of 66 millimeter, and then diastolic volume of 260, and the left ventricular ejection fraction of 29% with left ventricular diffuse severe hyperkinesis. This is cardioprobe transfer cardiography. It showed, uh, it shows uh, uh, effective mitral regurgitant or pass area of 0.57 square centimeter, and the mitral regurgitant volume was 62 millilitre, uh, which indicated obviously severe mitral regurgitation. This is transverse spagulated cardiography. It demonstrated severe mitral regurgitation as well as a transfer cardiography. And also demonstrated that the coaptation depth was 40 millimeter. Posterior mitral reflect morbidity of 11 millimeter. Post annulus diameter was 40 millimeter, and also mitral bulb area was 6.6 .6 square centimeter. And the right heart catheterization showed primary capillary wedge pressure of 33 millimeter of mercury with a giant V wave of 50 millimeter of mercury, and the cardiac index of 1.40 which indicated obviously low cardiac index. In the next session, Professor Sakata explained this concept of this proficient MR. This severe mitral regurgitation should be this proficient MR we, when we compare EROA and LB and diastolic volume, which is thought to be effective for mitral creep. And also according to anatomic criteria of mitral creep device implantation, many criteria such as central pathology, no reflect calcification, 
MVA and mobile, mobile lens this would be optimal for microclip for this patient. In summary, this case was symptomatic heart failure with ICM and severe functional MR. SDS predicted of mortality rate was 8.605%. This case should be disproportionate to severe MR and suitable anatomical criteria for microclip. Our heart team discussed the strategy for this patient, which would be best strategy between mitral creep, surgical MVR, or destination therapy LVAD. Taking into account for the high operative risk and not appropriate candidate of destination therapy LVAD because of social reasons, we selected to perform mitral creep as a first choice. This is a mitral clip procedure. The mitral clip procedure was conducted in a standard manner via the right femoral vein. This is a fast clip to the center of H2P2 leaflet. After the implantation of fast clip, as a lateral side of fast clip, moderate residual mitral regurgitation was observed. According to the discussion of the operator and the cardiographer, we decided add one more creep as a lateral site of first creep. This is first creep and this is second creep. So after the implantation of second creep, mitral regurgitation was reduced from severe to trivial. This is also the by commission view, also MR was decreased dramatically. And also the mean pressure gradient of transmitter flow after the placement of two creeps was only 2.9 millimeter of mercury, which indicated no severe mitral stenosis. One week after implantation of mitral creep, we performed right heart catheterization. The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure had declined from 33 at Puri to 19 one week after creep. And also giant blue wave would disappear. And also our cardiac index increased dramatically from 1.40 to 1.70. And transthoracic cardiography demonstrated that MR has been still mild at one week after the creep. The stroke bone was a little bit elevated. One, one week after implantation of mitral creep, BNP was dramatically decreased and on the chest X-ray congestion was improved. And the variable pressure was increased from 78 to 96. CRM creatinine was decreased from 2.30 to 1.66. At one month follow-up, his symptom was still improved with a stable BNP and renal function. That's why we tried to prescribe as inhibitor. And now at three months four up, his condition has been still stable. In summary, a prep patient with functional MR was referred to our hospital. We performed mitral creep according to heart team discussion. A diagnostic paradigm to guide which strategy to choose aerobado or mitral creep for patient with advanced heart failure and severe functional mitral regurgitation should be constructed. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the great case presentation, Dr. Nakamura. Dr. Nakamura showed the case in heart failure with secondary severe MR. The case is a debatable topic regarding the indication of treatment strategy and the effect of interventions in the advanced heart failure with MR. So next, Dr. Sakata will start his presentation for keynote lecture. Please, Dr. Sakata. Thank you very much for uh, this opportunity of a presentation. So let me start my uh, presentation. I have no COI in this presentation. So today I'd like to talk about the mitral crypt for the uh, functional uh, mitral regurgitation. 
So I'd like to talk about that, some evidences uh, in this area. So functional mitral regurgitation uh, often develops in patients with advanced heart failure. The severity of uh, FMR, functional mitral regurgitation, is associated with the patient's prognosis. But the therapeutic strategies to treat FMR that improve survival are limited. So uh, Daisuke uh, shows uh, this uh, indication. Uh, percutaneous mitral valve repair should be considered in the patient with half left uh, uh, above the 20% of LV ejection fraction who have symptomatic functional severe mitral regurgitation. So uh, this uh, 2021 guideline focus update on diagnosis and treatment of acute and chronic heart failure says this uh, indication. In addition, 2020 guideline on the management of barbara bar bar heart disease, uh, we should start first, uh, give appropriate treatment, including the uh, CRT and the PCI, and for the patients who still have symptoms, mitral creep uh, should be considered. Uh, left ventricular ejection fraction uh, divides, uh, divides uh, these patients into two groups. If a patient has left ventricular ejection fraction below 30%, we need to discuss the indication of mitral valve, mitral creep in heart verb team conference. So uh, the sub-analysis of co-op trial requires this discussion. In the co-op trial, patient with LVEF below 30% had more heart failure hospitalization than those with LVEF above 30%, although there was no difference in all cause mortality. However, in both group, uh, mitral creep seems to be more effective than uh, guideline-driven uh, medication therapy. So therefore, uh, uh, the ESC guideline recommends uh, choosing mitral creep if it responds to treatment. So uh, what kind of cases are considered uh, the responders. So uh, the, the ESC guideline, these six items had shown in this slide, uh, severe uh, vitral regurgitation, a symptomatic heart failure, uh, despite optimized uh, GDMT, and then VF should be a 20 to uh, 50 percent and importantly, the, uh, the guideline also said the LV endosystolic diameter less than the 70 millimeter. And at least one heart failure hospitalization within the previous year or increase uh, uh, natriuretic peptide levels. And of course, we need a good anatomy criteria for that uh, vital creep. So these items were divided from the result of two studies. This slide shows the result of the micro, micro uh, FR study. Uh, this study was conducted at the same time as the COP uh, studies. Unfortunately, uh, compared to the uh, COP trial, uh, micro, uh, in mitra FR study, mitra creep failed to benefit heart failure hospitalization and all cause mortality compared to the medication group. So I think that two uh, pathological determinants may explain these results. The first is the severity of vital regurgitation, and the second is a left ventricular endodiastolic volume. The COPT study contains more patient with higher E-R-O-A than the mitral, F, mitral FR study. In addition, the co study showed a more patient with smaller left ventricular and diastolic volumes than the mitral FR, mitral FR study. The smaller heart may be because the co study enrolled more patients with early uh, 
functional vital regurgitation without cardiac enlargement. And this small heart may have another meaning. So this slide shows the medication at baseline and after one year and the COPT, and the COPT study trial strongly recommended and closely monitor the administration of cardioprotective drugs before and after surgery. After an operation, the mitral crypt patients successfully received higher doses of cardioprotective medication, indicating that the smaller heart uh, more, has more room to respond to the cardioprotective medication. Thus, we need to evaluate uh, myocardial viability before vital creep. So as Daisuke shows in this slide, uh, uh, in uh, this patient fulfill the most of the anatomic criteria of a uh, mitral uh, of uh, mitral creep, and uh, in addition, this patient has uh, uh, more uh, uh, mitral regurgitation than the uh, the patient with mitral FR and uh, uh, the smaller heart uh, than this patient. So uh, this mean this may mean that this patient have uh, uh, some uh, left ventricular viability uh, of the uh, left ventricle. So uh, in summary, uh, the patients with severe functional mitral regurgitation shows a pro poor prognosis. Guidelines recommended mitral creep for the patients who are expected to respond to treatment. So uh, prediction of responders will need the left ventricular viability in addition to evaluation of regurgitation volume and anatomical criteria. That's my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you for the excellent keynote lecture with important data, Dr. Sakata. So Dr. Sakata showed the indication and clinical data for treatment intervention of severe MR. So regarding response to mitral creep is an important topic when, when we consider the treatment decision. So Dr. Sakata clearly showed these interesting topics and answered. So when thinking about mitral valve disease, other cardiac function, such as left ventricular function, including variability, must be considered. So there are some questions from comment box. So the, okay. The first question is the uh, uh, indications for grip uh, expanding in the clinical works. So this patient had a secondary MR and the case is suitable to mitral creep. So what do you think about the mitral creep for primary MR? So in Japan, mitral creep is used in 70% of MR patients. So please answer the Dr. Nakamura or Dr. Sakata. Uh, thank you for good question. I will answer this. I will answer. Um, Actually, primary MR represents only 25% in Japanese mitral creep cohort. However, acute procedure success rate is even high. I think which was 90% was not inferior to the functional MR. And also Italian registry demonstrated that a two-year follow-up primary MR was associated with better clinical outcome compared with functional MR. There were mitral creep to primary MR would be safety and effective. However, in some patients, I think recurrent mitral regurgitation occurred and all cause mortality was related to the recurrent MR for the primary MR. Uh, that's why we should pay attention to the predictor of recurrence of primary MR. Uh, for example, in our experience, the barrel disease were, was likely to occur recurrent MR after mitral creep. Therefore, we should carefully select appropriate case for mitral creep as well as uh, uh, functional MR. Uh, Thank you. I have, oh, a, I have another yes. comment. Sorry. Please. So I think that uh, after the mitral creep procedure, the, some patient has a residual uh, regurgitation. And after that, uh, the surgical repair is 
will be a very difficult or maybe impossible. So I think that we have to uh, uh, be careful uh, to determine the procedure uh, because uh, uh, after uh, the, uh, the surgical treatment will be very difficult uh, after the uh, mitral creep. Thank you. So the next question is, so looking at the initial clinical presentation and catheter data in the present case, inotropic including dobutamine or a mechanical support such as impera are mandatory. However, once these treatments are introduced, mitral creep is not allowed to be performed in Japan. How did you deal with this problem in the present case? So maybe it means that they are including in the contraindications uh, af after the mechanical support. So uh, please question, uh, please answer the Dr. Fujino or Dr. Sakana, uh, Sakata, please. So I think that that is a very important point. So now my trip uh, procedure is allowed only in a stable, uh, only in a stable condition. So, uh, but uh, now we accumulate the many evidences of the safety or uh, tactics of, uh, of this procedure. So uh, in the near future, we have to discuss uh, that uh, the indication of a, a patient with a, a MCS, a mechanical circulatory support. But now, but now we have to uh, uh, make an effort to accumulate the, uh, the uh, cases uh, uh, for, for the uh, safety of this procedure, I think. Thank you for the answer. So the last question if, uh, is, uh, if this patient does not have any social causes, such as caregiver problems, what do you think about the op option of Elvado? In this case, the indication of, is of Elvado is also expanding in Japan. So answer, please. Well, thank you for good question. And uh, this is really important point. So because the destination Elvado treatment has started in Japan, and DT Elvado is now indicated for people even over 65 years old. Actually, Eduardo implantation in patient with an intermax profile four is controversial. This patient profile was actually four. Because several large scale studies might not support aggressive airway therapy because of frequently admission due to device related complication. On the other hand, a small cohort demonstrated specific risk factors, including severe ventricular arrhythmia or elevated BNP. And this patient's BNP was really high. Nevertheless, I would not select herbal therapy as a first choice because this patient's heart rate risk score was medium, which shows a poor estimated one year survival after Elvado. Now JCS guideline recommended the patient with heart rate risk low score for DT Elvado. And also he had this proportionate MR, which was thought to be effective for mitral creep. That's why I would select uh, mitral creep as a first choice. Thank you for the answer. So, okay, so there's no end to the discussion, So, but it seems that time has come. So we will have closing remarks from Professor Tsutsui. So please. Okay. Uh, in Today's webinar, we discussed the guideline directed pharmacological and non pharmacological therapy of HEFREF uh, based on the two representative cases. First case is the uh, opportunity of reverse cardiac remodeling obtained by the optimization of pharmacological therapy for HEFREF. And the second case is the uh, importance of optimal selection of the suitable patient with severe functional mitral regurgitation associated with FRF for mitral creep. So we learned 
once again, the importance of guideline directed management and therapy to improve the outcome of patients with heart failure. Today's focus is the uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, thank you very much for wonderful presentation from Dr. Fujino and Dr. Nakamura and uh, very uh, educative discussion with Dr. Ide and Dr. Sakata. And finally, a very wonderful uh, facilitation by Dr. Kusunose. This JCS guideline webinar is delivered on demand, so you can obtain more information on our SNS or the upcoming Japanese Circulation Society website that will be available soon. And also, I need to mention that the Japanese Circulation Society guideline today we discussed is uh, you can see on our website uh, freely. So thank you very much again for participating in this Japanese Circulation Society guideline webinar. See you next time.